Hey, Angelo. Good to see you, man. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's awesome to have you on here. I've been a follower of your work for a while now, and I just love what you're putting out in the world, man. Well, thanks. Yeah, and, it's been an interesting ride over the last few years. <laughs> and I thought I thought maybe that's where we could start is is the ride you've been on. And I've given the audience a little bit of background about you in the introduction. And I guess my question would be is when did all of this awakening and interest in consciousness come to be in your own life? Sure. Yeah. You know, very young actually, um, before I had words for it, to be honest, in retrospect, it's obvious, even as a child, like being around adults, um, was increasingly uncomfortable. And, but Mm. of course I didn't think of it in those terms. I didn't have a sense of autonomy such that I could say, well, I'm going to construct a life where I'm not around adults with repressed emotions. It's nothing like that. I just felt it all the time. And it felt, it felt like a heaviness. The more, the older I got, the more obvious that was. So again, as a child, I wasn't even thinking about that as such, but in retrospect, it's very obvious how it got, it started formed around me and inside me and just really grasped, you know, grasped onto my internal experience, this sense of heaviness and around specifically adults that were more sort of emotionally unavailable or had a lot of repressed emotion or very in their head, it was much Mm. heavier. And so I had family members like that. So I could feel it all the time. It was a very empathic experience for me. And it was a very heavy one. So that was kind of childhood. Um, And then as I moved into starting to form an internal thinking world, right? Um, You know, rudimentary thoughts start in very early childhood, but we really start to feel like a cognitive self, a self-reflecting continuous entity, you know, somewhere in later childhood, early teens, you know, mid-teens and so forth. And then when we enter puberty, we become socially aware. And that's a whole other set of internal responses that are physiologic in nature that come online. And that really starts to solidify that sense of the person, the, the internal self, the one who has to solve its problems and live in this world in relation to all of these other people that have their own internal worlds and so forth, right? That became extremely uncomfortable for me and probably was for many people. But again, it's like something you don't talk about, right? There's so much unexpressed, uncommunicated angst in this world. So as I was kind of moving into teen years, it became a combination of that sort of heaviness and internal, maybe emotional experience of um, pain or whatever, accompanied by this internal narrative, this thought stream that just never stopped. And the more, the more thinking I did, I tried to think my way out of the problem of thinking. And it was like adding gasoline to put a fire out for me, not for everybody. I don't think, but for me, it felt really, really painful. I can relate to that for sure. Um, and what you realize is that you can't win that battle. Trying to outthink the thoughts. Nope. You, if you go to war with your thoughts, this, the war will never end. And you're going up against an enemy that is far older than you are. <laughs> it has more experience. It knows more than you do about thought and identity. Not to personify the collective ego or the collective you know, pain body or consciousness, but it, it does exist. And as you go through this process we're going to talk about, you learn to form a, a very um, distinct respect for it. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. The word the forces rever- of delusion run very deep. Mind. Nice. So, okay. So that was your kind of adolescent years, the incessant thinking. Yeah. And it culminated in this interesting thought loop that was something like, what is wrong with me? I remember thinking this in my teen years, like, hmm. what is wrong with me? What the heck is wrong with me? You know, and, and then it would turn into these iterations, like looking out at other people and going, well, they look happy. Why do they look happy? Why do they look relaxed? I never feel relaxed. You know, what is wrong with me? Like it felt, it felt like hyper personal at some point. Mm. Looking back, it was the the attempt to keep using those internal thoughts to go internal, to like have this internal world I was protecting and hiding from. I don't even know who or what, maybe even myself. But that very act of keep continuing to go internal and tighten up that internal space, that itself was what made it feel hyper personal, right? Maybe this sounds obvious, like from the outside, but when you're inside it, 
it wasn't obvious. It was very painful and it felt small and enclosed and frustrating. But the thought loop was, what the heck is wrong with me? And it felt horrible to think that. And yet, I guess something in me had the instinct that there was actually a solution. You know, I didn't know there was a solution, but looking at it in the right way, um, even though it could sound negative or self uh, critical or something, looking at it in the right way, that question's actually a really good question. What's wrong with, I might restate it now because I know more about it. What's wrong with the way I'm perceiving myself? What is flawed mm. about the, what I'm taking myself to be and without, and without looking at it, like I wasn't looking clearly at what I actually feel like I am. And I would argue that almost nobody actually does. I know this because I work with people going through this. And when they really start to take a look at what they're taking themselves to be, then they get a taste of what is beyond that. And that is always surprising. <laughs> always. Well, it's one of the unique features of this journey is that you don't know until you know, right? It's, yeah. I, I had, I had this something, I had a very small example of this happen yesterday where I had someone doing, um, mouth work, like a massage on my jaw. And she was like, Oh my God, you are so tight. You've been holding so much tension in your jaw. And I just thought that was just how my jaw felt for all these years. I just had no idea of the other, any other potentiality. Yeah. Um, and, and it wasn't until after she did that work and I started to feel the jaw open up and I was like, Oh, this is what my jaw is supposed to feel like. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating and it's kind of a metaphor for just the whole consciousness experience for me at least. Yeah. Yeah. So we can go through it in more detail if you want. It's, it's an interesting story. And I find that it, the story itself, hearing it can actually sort of transmit the flavor of it to some people. You know, if I talk to a group of 500 people about this, I have no doubt that a good handful of them are going to have a significant shift in identity. I know this through experience. And more than that are going to become interested in this topic. And sometime down the road, they are, they're also going to experience that. So this is a powerful um, conversation we're having. And I can go into a few details about why that is. But to fast forward a little bit, just for the moment, to touch back on what you just said, one of the biggest things I noticed after this big shift in identity for me was the weight being gone. It just felt like there was this huge weight mm. lifted that I had never realized I was carrying. Like as if I was carrying a backpack for 20 years and every I don't know, five minutes, someone put one more grain of sand in it or something. And it just, over the years, it just became so heavy. I had no idea how heavy it was to drag myself around through life, how much resistance, how much hesitation I was carrying with me. I, I kind of sensed it, but I had no idea the magnitude of it until it was like that, it was gone. And so that is a huge eye opener. Um, and then you do start to find it in, in more subtle places, maybe even in the body, as you were describing, and this goes on and on. I can talk more about it, but yeah, it's a, it's a big surprise how much strain we hold within ourselves, especially in that psychological identity space until it's released. Yeah. Uh, I, I can definitely relate to your experience and, um, yeah, I, th I think the only indicator that I had similar to you outside myself that perhaps I was carrying some excess weight is when I would look at other people and there would seemingly be this levity to the way that they carried themselves. And I would compare that with my inner experience, which was constantly grasping for control of everything just to feel okay. Mm -hmm. And it seemed as though there were other people out there that didn't have that, which was the only way that I could really identify that perhaps I was suffering and that perhaps yeah. there was another way. Yep. Yep. I can relate to that totally. And I find that is the case in people who um, are really primed to go through this shift. I'm going to talk about this awakening that they, they feel just like how you described. That was really articulate, that you've just felt like you've been trying to grasp and pull and push on life and control, but you've been like overtly aware of pulling all those levers all these years and just not getting it. Like something just yeah. feels so wrong about trying yeah. to do this, right? Whereas I think some people, it's like they are pulling on the levers, but they're kind of happily, blissfully unaware of it maybe. And it's just not a heavy thing for them until it is. So anyone can wake up. 
but often the conditions of your life have to be set up for it. So often people who I find have that sort of levity, just really a kind of ease in life. So often I find that's pretty conditions based, meaning they just, they've kind of lucked out. They kind of rolled the, mm. rolled the good dice for this lifetime. They had good relationships and good parents and haven't had a lot of trauma. And then they lose a loved one or, you know, whatever, like whatever trauma happens in life, whatever disruption in your expectation of how life should go that really shows you, okay, yeah, things aren't, things aren't going to just go the way I hope they will necessarily. Then all of a sudden they start to feel that seeking energy more that um, like, wait a minute, what's really going on here? What's going on behind the scenes? What have I been hiding from myself? And once you start to notice it, you notice more of it and you kind of can't look away at some point. Yeah. So. One of the things I think is so fascinating about the entrepreneur audience is you really have these two camps of people. One is these people that actually are able to consistently achieve everything that they could ever imagine. And they have that feeling of, mm -hmm. wait, something still feels wrong. Or the people that have so much identity wrapped up in their accomplishing that when that doesn't work well, their existing paradigm crumbles. Mm. Um, and it's really hard. And so you have this kind of like polarity that exists between success and failure that in many cases seems to be an accelerant for these intense people. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would agree with that. It's funny. I was watching an, a, a video interview podcast from a pretty well-known um, uh, entrepreneur and he, he was very clear. He's actually quite a present guy, but I sensed exactly that. It's like this guy has pushed and pushed and fallen down so many times in life, but hasn't quite questioned his identity yet, you know? Mm. And it's like someone like that, I almost like don't even want to say this to them. I just, just keep doing what you're doing. It's fine. Enjoy it. You're making things happen. You're, in, you're succeeding. It's great. You know, it's fine. This will, if this knocks on your door, it'll knock on your door and you'll know it. There's no way you're going to look away from it. You can't. Uh, and then other people, yeah. If you, if you fall down hard enough, you just go, wait a minute, what the hell am I doing? You know, why do I think the next, you know, million dollars is going to make me happy when the last 3 million didn't it's, it's, you know, it's fine to do all that. There's nothing wrong with engaging in life as we see it, like in, in the relative world of having relationships and having hobbies and jobs and pastimes and passions and, you know, really giving your whole self and your will to a, to a, to a vocation or to an entrepreneurship. There's really nothing intrinsically wrong with any of that. I don't think. Um, but when, for me, at least until you've, until I addressed that primary issue of identity, none of that would have worked for me. Afterward, it was easy. It was actually quite effortless in, in a lot of ways to, to move through things that with that sense of identity intact would have been really difficult for me. Although I do see people who almost use that internal pain to drive themselves forward, um, you know, and- it seems like I, most, I see most, most do. Most do. I see it in physicians a lot because I, those are the kind of people I'm around that are very high functioning, maybe a surrogate of what you're talking about or a, a related mindset of just, using work as your, your sort of bastion of hope and I, putting your identity around working really hard. And it's rewarded in the relative sense, right? In the, in the, in the social matrix we live in, it is rewarded to work hard and to be smart. Those two things are quite rewarded financially through respect, through all kinds of things. Um, but again, this identity thing is just not even of that order. It's so it's just beyond all of that. And if it call, if it starts poking at your back, it starts tapping you on the shoulder. That tap will get louder and louder until you turn around is what I found. Yeah. And so when I, when I have this conversation with people or we have these kinds of, you know, interviews and I know a lot of people are listening, they're going to be people who are just not interested. And I'd be I'd like, that is totally fine. Go do your thing. But there are going to be people who are like, man, that's been happening to me for the last five years and I need to address it. And then that's where I come in. That's where I say, Hey, let me show you how. <laughs> You know, well, I can show you, I can walk you to the edge. I can't it, step over, but I can walk you to the edge. Well, it's, it's, uh, much appreciated. And Angelo, I mean, what was the key inflection point for you and your own self-concept that yeah. really shifted things? Good question. So I would say it was a convergence of a couple of things. One was just a slow grinding and a slow realizing thing after thing that, no matter what I accomplished. And I was, I had a pretty, pretty good work ethic and I, I was pretty smart so I could get things done. I did well in jobs I had and, and, but I never, it never felt deeply satisfying. 
it would be satisfying in the short term if I accomplished something or whatever. But then pretty quickly it was like, I need the next thing. And I'd be yeah. then I'd be thinking, why do I need the next thing? Why why does my mind automatically just pop right into the future and I can't enjoy anything? Why why is that? Right? Why can't I actually just enjoy being alive, whether or not I'm doing anything? So that became blatantly obvious in my early 20s that like none of this stuff I'm doing is going to really satisfy whatever it is that's here. And then the the that was kind of the slow grind that was building up to it. And as that built, it was just a matter of time. It was a matter of coming into the right circumstances. So for me, the, interestingly, the right circumstances is one of the things that just never worked for me in my teens and 20, early 20s was relationship, like romantic relationship. I had had very short connections and stuff, but I, I never could emotionally connect because of a, like so much emotional repression growing up. Like that's my family model was just a lot of repression and so forth. So um, I just couldn't connect and, and I didn't really know why, but I kind of knew why I just, it was a very frustrating thing. And no matter what I understood about it, it just didn't work. It just, I couldn't get it to work. But then I, I so I had this kind of moment over a short period of time where I met somebody that I felt like, okay, this is like the kind of person I really want to be with. Like this, you know, if there's something in the back of my mind that says, you know, what's going to really finally make me happy in life, that perfect romantic partner, this was, this would have been the one, right? So I found that person. It was someone that I was just dating, you know, and it went as wrong as it could have possibly (laughs) gone. It was not at all what I could have ever imagined it was in so many ways. And it was kind of short lived. And then it, it just sort of ended. And it was simultaneously like the worst place I'd ever been because I was disillusioned about that final place I'd held hope out, which was a person other than me to be around me to make me feel better somehow. So that hope was dashed. And it was a combination of that feeling of just kind of utter hopelessness, I guess, in in the usual ways of, that we go about trying to be happy. Um, and at the same time, something just said, okay, it's totally time to look somewhere else, go completely off the map, completely outside the box. I don't even know where I need to look, but it's not in the usual place. I know that. Um, It's not in any way I've thought about myself. It's not in any thing anyone's ever taught me, but instinctually, I just knew there was somewhere else to look. And I will preface that by saying over the years, I had been interested in Eastern thought, like kind of martial arts, but even with martial arts, I was more interested in the the philosophy, the Zen, you know, quotes by Zen masters you'd find here mm-hmm. and there and um, Hinduism. I'd read the Tao Te Ching or parts of it. I, it didn't make a lick of sense to me. I'd read the words in the Tao Te Ching and go, this is like complete nonsense words. Like, You know, I just read a review of my own book on Amazon, strangely, and it was a one star review. And it basically said this whole book is just full of words, you know, and it doesn't upset me. I totally understand that. You know, other reviews are like this book changed my life in ways I can't even describe. Right. Why that divergence? Because when the mind is tight like that, it doesn't want to see beyond itself. And that's how I felt reading these things. I was like, there's there's got to be something here. My instinct told me, why is this book popular after twenty five hundred years? And I can't make a lick of sense out of it, right? So I had read these things. I had collected a few books here and there, but I I don't feel like I got anywhere with them. And all of a sudden it was like, I knew to turn to that somehow. I knew to go grab a book off the shelf that I hadn't even read called The Three Pillars of Zen. And I'll give a little background on this. The Three Pillars of Zen is very unique. Uh, It's a very unique book as far as Zen books about Zen or Buddhism go. And it's for one specific reason. So very broadly speaking in Buddhism in general, and the way it's practiced today, it's not, it's common to talk about the four noble truths and enlightenment as this sort of thing that can happen after many lifetimes or something Buddha achieved. It's very common that that people understand that doctrine and the beliefs and so forth. It's very, very uncommon to find areas of Buddhism where people talk very directly about that happening to you right now like mm. right now in this lifetime. And that, and the point isn't about old monks and Zen masters and Buddha. The point is about you. And that's really in my, not just my opinion, but it, it, that's the point of Buddhism of the Pali Canon and the suttas, which it all came from the, the initial writings. That's what it's actually pointing to. And in this Zen book, this three pillars of Zen, the teacher, the Zen master who wrote it did something very, very unique and pretty much unheard of. 
he had, I think, nine different people who went through that process. They call it Kensho in Zen, which is that first big awakening, the first huge step toward enlightenment, which is it's not a change in paradigm, not a change in thought or belief or understanding. It's a fundamental change in the, in the way you experience yourself in reality. And nine different people wrote what it was like to go through it in their own words, in their own life. Mm. And I read those, I read that chapter and I was like, this right here, this is it. I can feel this. I felt like I had done this before, actually. It was, I just got chills. Awesome. Yeah. I was like, this is where I'm going. I know exactly what they're talking about. I don't know the words they're using, but I know exactly what they're talking about. And I don't care if I die, I'm going there. And that, and that was it. I mean, just reading those accounts and having gone through that last rug pull of, you know, the last thing I was holding out for to make me happy in this life. I was like, I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to give everything to this, meaning all of my identity, whatever I have, my will. And I did. <laughs> and within a few days or a couple of weeks, it was, it was probably, I'm thinking a couple of weeks, this is 25 years ago. So it's hard to remember, but I think within a couple of weeks, I reread those sections in that book over and over. And I like learned to kind of practice personally through while I was meditating in the way they were describing in the book, the Zen teacher was pointing people to this in another chapter of how to do it very specifically. And I sort of figured it out. And then it wasn't just when I was meditating, I was doing it like 24 seven. I'd wake up doing this and I'd go to sleep to that last glimmer of consciousness orienting toward this um, possibility. And that's what did it. <clears throat> wow. And was just to get specific, was that experience that you're pointing to, was that I, the separation from thoughts and the identification as awareness or what was the level of depth of- I, I would that? say, yeah, that's a, that's a good way of saying it, but I really caution people here about, un, about adopting a concept about this because I want anyone who's listening, who, who also got chills, who understands what I'm saying at an instinctual level, this is not about any concept at all. Anything anyone knows about awareness or consciousness or can show or awakening, all of those, you can go right past all that. Um, so what actually occurs um, in words, I can, I can sort of say the best I can, but what's more important is what occurred subjectively what occurred as someone moving through this experience. Um, that's be the better way to transmit it in my experience, the better way to speak it to, to someone who might be interested in what this is. Um, so what the initial part of it is pretty much what you said. And that was to start to, you, you have to realize thoughts as thoughts. And most people can do that to some degree. Now, some people are so identified with thoughts they don't even know they're thinking. I heard a quote somewhere that Sam Harris had said, having an ego is what it feels like to be thinking without knowing you're thinking. And I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. So there are people who are just so identified with thoughts and are there, I think they're often the very, you know, re relaxed people. They just doesn't matter. They don't feel that internal tension yet. They may at some point. Um, so yeah, you're not too worried about your inner world. You know, it's just kind of there. But when you start to become aware of thoughts as such, when you can stop for a moment and go, oh, I just had an internal narrative that was like wondering about what I'm going to have for breakfast. Oh, you became aware of a thought, right? Um, that level of becoming aware of thought is like mindfulness, right? The, the sort of mindfulness practice and so forth. And it's valuable. What, what happened for me here was I realized that not only are those things thoughts, any image in my mind is a thought. Any self-image in my mind is a thought. Any memory about me is a thought. Every single memory, all the memories together collated into one experience called I is also a thought. I realized everything is a thought in this, in this experience of the moment. Reflecting on anything is a thought. Noticing I have a sensation, noticing it is a thought. Self-monitoring what's happening in this moment, it's also a thought. Going, oh, wow, when I start to disentangle from thoughts, I get really quiet. That's another thought. Where is it? What space does that put you in? Until you, I, until I disidentified from thoughts so thoroughly that um, I can't even describe that experience. It's not describable. It's not. It's not in the realm of concepts, thoughts, descriptions, labels at all. Um, but it was familiar, more familiar than anything I'd ever experienced. More familiar 
than that internal thought storm, more familiar than the repressed emotional experience, more familiar than anything I'd ever thought about myself and more familiar than anything I'd ever perceived in the world. It was this like pure familiarity with no content. Mm. I can use analogies. It was like light. Like instead of light shining on objects, you could say throughout your life, the light beam of your attention is shining on thought objects. Like, oh, that person, that situation, this view of myself, this thought about myself, those are objects of thought, but there's a sort of light shining on those. And so if you could imagine somehow that attention turns away from the objects of thought, which are actually formed from the thought and turns directly into its own source. So it's just like pure light. I can say pure consciousness, but knowing this does you no good. In fact, it can be counterproductive. You have to go there. You have to actually disidentify from thoughts actively in a very precise way if you want to know what I'm talking about. And you can, anyone listening can. So you had this experience and did that stabilize? Was that? Was... Oh, it changed everything. So, so that first part I was describing of becoming disidentified from thought, even the most fundamental thoughts, like I am a person, I'm here, there's a world. I'm separate from a world. Like all of those thoughts were gone. All those perceptions were gone. So can you imagine right now, anyone listening, what your experience would be like right now when you, if you lost the perception of being separate, if you lost perception that there is separation anywhere, if you lost perception of being a separate entity moving through a life and inhabiting a body, imagine that not being there. You can't imagine it. It's not imaginable because if you imagine it, there's someone there holding on to that imagination to, to stabilize itself. So that was gone. So to talk about what came after that is literally impossible, but I will, I can tell you the effects of it. That'd one effect of it <laughs> was the, <laughs> one effect of it was it changed fundamentally and permanently changed my view of everything that had ever happened to me. There was no sense anymore really of being someone separate from a world that had to navigate the world that had to figure things out in a thought world um, to sort anything out, to make itself feel better, to hesitate from anything, to push against anything, to pull anything towards itself in life. All that went away. Um, and what's left is this experience that you won't be labeling. You won't be going, oh, I'm in consciousness. It's not like that. I, I might just call it consciousness. Um, but it's the most primary experience of knowing, of being, of feeling without any object of that experience. It's pure experiencing let's say, but without a split between a subject and an object. So what happened after that was so profound. Um, there, there, were, <laughs> there were so many layers of, of identity that dropped away be below that even, that have no names, that have no names in this cognitive world. It was seen that this cognitive world I'm talking about, this world we usually agree upon exists, is a tiny little grain of sand literally a grain of sand in this infinite, I, I, I can't even call it anything. It's a, a cosmos of experience or identity or energy, space time. I don't know what it is, but the, the underlying structures that even allowed that to remain intact started breaking, 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 like scaffolding falling. Um, it's, it, 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 I would say it's like the ultimate psychedelic experience, but a psychedelic experience by definition is an experience. This is not an experience. This happened at the identity level. So what I was, was, to, was just breaking apart completely. And it was not even breaking apart. It was seen. It was never there really. And so there was this free fall, um, but there was no one free falling. Uh, it was literally everything, the, the cosmos, but it was also nothing there nothing of substance. It was exquisitely paradoxical. It was profoundly familiar, beyond familiar. Um, still is, still is always here. Um, like a, it's like a thousand suns burning endlessly. It's just so, it's a very, very powerful realization. Um, but you'll carry it with you and you can never, you, you can never really say what it is. Even if you don't talk about it at all for the rest of your life, People around you may know something's different about you to some degree, but they'll never see what you see. They'll never experience what you experience. So it's a very solitary journey in one way. Yes. <laughs> There's, you can't share it directly with people, but once you're clear in it and once it's really clarified, stabilized and so forth, 
you'll know when other people have experienced that level. You'll know it. And you'll see the people who have gotten to certain parts of it, but not not really dropped all the way through. And it's fine. There's no judgment at all. And it's it's not an experience of add it's not an additive experience. It's not like I have something other people don't have. It's nothing like that at all. It's again very paradoxical, but what everybody's actually experiencing right now is what I'm talking about. It's just that there's an added layer on top that that is really very thin. It's based in thoughts and reactions to thoughts and this illusion of identity. It's very thin, but it has a very, very profound subjective effect. In fact, it creates subjectivity. It creates the experience of subjectivity. Have we gone down the rabbit so, hole far enough yet? <laughs> yes, we have. I have so many questions. Um, I think if I was listening to this, what you're talking about might sound really scary. It can be for sure. Absolutely. So I, I don't pull any punches about this. My first chapter, my intro chapter talks about what we've been talking about, kind of how I got to this space or whatever. The set, but the first chapter called chapter one is called a word of caution. And the whole chapter is full of kind of cautions and stuff like that. Um, I will say my overarching sense of all of this, or I would never talk about it at all, is that it's actually completely okay. In the end, everything is more than okay. I would, anyone who's oriented to this process or is already happening or they're, they, they actually can honestly say it's really the most important thing to them. You're fine. You're going to go through things you that will really, really surprise you. You'll experience, you'll experience fear in a way you've never fe experienced it before because you'll experience it directly. You, you'll go through all kinds of weird stuff, but in the end, it will turn out more than okay for you. It, you will never give it back. You would never, ever, ever want to give this back. Um, but yeah, to the, to the one that really wants to convince itself, it lives in this mental timeline that that's very, very real. There's nothing outside of it. I, the way I believe the world is really, really is the way it is. And I really don't want to question those beliefs. Just turn this off now, to be honest. You don't want to hear this. It's going to, it, it can disrupt that. Um, but what I find again, when I talk to a large audience is a mixed experience. There are people who are going to, it's going to trigger fear in them. And if it does trigger fear, it's okay. I just tell people, just feel it. It's an experience. It's an emotion. Even if this doesn't completely play out in the way it did for me, for anyone listening to this, but they can actually touch into their own fear underneath their identity structure in a very direct way, that's going to do nothing but help you in your life. It's going to do nothing but be, give you the ability to, to empathize with people that you would have normally not been able to empathize with. It's going to be able to help you when you're, someone you love, your child, your partner goes through really difficult things. You're going to under, you're not going to, they're not going to feel your distance from them because you're afraid of that. And your identify, your identity is keeping you from touching into it. They're going to feel that you were there with them. So it's okay to go through these existential fears, even if this doesn't lead to awakening and, and realization for you. Um, but if it does head down that path of moving toward awakening and realization, you can bet at some point you're going to come into contact with existential <laughs> fear. It just happens. Yeah. It happens to people with like, other things too, like psychedelics, you know, and theogens and all those things, you know, they're becoming so mainstream now, ayahuasca and stuff like you come into contact with those kinds of things in those spaces as well. Um, the difference is this happens dead sober. Yeah. And <clears throat> with a level of permanency. Um, yeah. so I, one of the things you said is that <clears throat> anyone can have this happen to them and it can happen quickly. Yes. There's a certain kind of process um, or mechanism, I guess, which can propel someone there. What What is your perspective on that? It can happen very quickly. I've, I've seen it happen to people with no warning at all. They had no contact with a teaching about this. They didn't do self-inquiry. They don't really meditate. And it's just happened out of the blue. That's reasonably rare, but it definitely happens. I've seen people... Um, that I've personally interacted with that I came into contact with him, like physically were around them and I could see it. I could sort of see it waiting to happen in them, just the way they move and so forth. And I, I might bring it up very casually just out of curiosity. Cause I, I don't talk about this unless people ask I'm invited to, or I'm making a YouTube video for people who are already interested in it. I don't just talk to my friends about this or random people. Hey, right? what's your self identity? <laughs> it can be very destabilizing. Um, so 
but on occasion, for whatever reason, I'll actually see it, see it in somebody or I meet them in a setting like at a retreat or whatever. And I can just tell like they they don't have a lot of scaffolding left. There's there's something ready to just break there. And I've seen it with in those situations with people where I've sat down and talked to them for an hour and a half and they have an awakening that night. I've seen it happen in a few months. Um, it can happen very quickly. So again, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, this is where I need to go, it can probably happen for you very quickly and, and you'll be okay. But it can be very steep for some people. Now for other people, it happens over a few years. Okay. And for other yet other people, it can take a long, long time. But I will tell you, I, I can't really offend anybody because no one specifically would even know I'm talking to them now. But I have come into contact with people who will say, I've been at this for 30 years. It's not happened for me. You know, what's going on? What's wrong? And the more I talk to them, the more I realize they, they actually aren't quite ready for it. They don't really, it's not really their priority. Like they are, they're interested, but more from the standpoint of, I feel like those people out there have something I don't have, you know? And I tell people, take your time with this stuff. Like really, you're, you have an instinct that knows how, how quickly you can handle going through this. And, and and I really believe that now just from coming into contact with so many different types of people. So what I start with is don't worry how long it'll take. Ask yourself the really important questions. And, and you should ask yourself these questions even outside of this topic, in my opinion, what do I really, really want? I'm sure in the world of entrepreneurship, that's an extremely important question. What do I really want to do? What do I want to spend my time doing in life? Do I want to work for somebody? Or do I want to create something new, right? These fundamental questions are so important. But if that answer to that question is what Angela's talking about, um, that's great. That's awesome. But if it's not, look at what your real motivations are. Like if there's some part of you that's like, I really just want to start a family. That's what I've always wanted. That's what I want to do. That's awesome. Do that, you know, be really, really honest and authentic with yourself and things will come into alignment. And when you're really ready to open to this, then it, the conditions will be better for you. It'll be less disorienting. Mm, I think that's really sound advice. One thing that you alluded to was this notion of people listening to you speak um, or perhaps being around you and then that basically initiating some type of shift in someone. Mm. And you read a lot about this with people being in the presence of a guru and you know, they feel amazing and something, some eureka moment goes off. What is your interpretation of that? Yeah. So what you're talking about, I, I usually use a simple word transmission. There's something that gets transmitted. Um, so I'll say a couple things about it. And I'm glad you mentioned the guru thing. So first of all, it definitely happens. Now, understand from my own perspective, um, I don't have an agenda with this. In fact, I often, as you've heard in this conversation, will maybe talk, try to talk people out of it sometimes, but, but, um, I didn't talk about it for many years after this happened to me, not because I was afraid to talk about it, but I knew the power of talking in a very direct way. I could see the effect it has on people. And I don't, I don't think I had the discernment that I would trust how and when to talk about this and to what degree I would mention the, you know, the risks of it and so forth and all of it. Like I just didn't have the maturity, I guess, in myself. So I really just put it on a shelf as far as talking about it. I never even thought I would, honestly. So I don't have an agenda like, hey, you need this. You need to elevate consciousness. You need to push consciousness to the next level in your life. I don't believe that. It's not true. I don't actually see it that way. Um, so I have no agenda with it. It's not a better or worse state. It's a very different experience internally, for sure. But it's, again, something's been taken away, not added. <laughs> so there's nothing special about it. So this leads into the conversation about gurus, right? I think what happened, you know, and, and the term guru is Indian and it, this all, even Buddhism came from India, right? So India has the most rich spiritual tradition of any place in the world, period. It just does. And, and it's, it's very revered. Uh, enlightenment is revered there, all that stuff. And it's wonderful. But of course, everything has side effects. Everyone in India is not enlightened, right? So what you do have in India sometimes also is you have unenlightened people who are a little bit sociopathic and they realize they can defraud people out of money by saying I'm a guru and talking about love, peace. And like, it happens. Like we have to be honest, it happens. There are personality disorders in the world and so forth. So, so the term guru, I think, unfortunately has been dirtied up a lot by people who have bad intentions, even coming from a, a very rich culture. And so it's, it's very common there. And a lot of that came to the West. It happens not just in, in Indian spiritual traditions. It happens in uh, Buddhist spiritual traditions. There's been Zen masters who were pretty screwed up, you know? Um, and so 
the 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 reason I'm bringing this up is I think it's really important for anyone to hear this to realize if you're interested in this yourself, there are people who just interacting with them can transmit it for sure. It can definitely accelerate your process. And it doesn't even have to be in person. It can be over video, on the phone, mm -hmm. if you're working with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. It can even be through videos and books. It, def it happened for me through a book, right? So the transmission is very real. But don't ever convince yourself that there's a special enlightened person out there that, that has some magical, mystical powers they're going to give you. It's nonsense. That's what leads people to getting sucked in by unscrupulous types. You have to take the responsibility of this on yourself, period. So again, I can walk people to the edge. I can show them how to go, go there. I can show them how to self-inquire, but I can't do the real work. And the real work is a, a really about letting go. And then ultimately, it's about a lot of integration. I can't do any of that for you, anybody because I'm not special. There's, it's not like that. So I really want to make that distinction between unfortunate you know, situations where charismatic people who are a little unscrupulous put themselves in positions that make themselves seem more spiritual or whatever. That's really not how I see it. The, the really clear, deeply realized people I see are extremely humble. Many of them don't teach and don't even want to teach and have no public persona at all. Um, and they're very, very clear. But just being around them, especially if you directly engage in this conversation, will be very potent. So transmission is a very real thing, but it comes with baggage, of course, because we're humans and humans think in terms of social hierarchies and all of that. This has nothing to do with any of that. This just has to do with direct, direct communication of it. And it shouldn't cost you a lot of money to do that, to interact with somebody. You know, um, There are people who do this for a living and they, they'll, they'll work with you one-on-one -on -one and they may charge something and that's fine. But you know, people shouldn't expect to pay exorbitant amounts to, to, to teachers or gurus or give themselves over to, to, to people so that they get some special transmission. That's all fraud, in my opinion. Hmm. Yeah. That makes sense? I think that's good advice. Yeah, it does. It does. And I've experienced the power of transmission, not to the extent that you talk about, but you know, when I read a book like Eckhart Tolle's, you know, I'll just be dropped in complete presence. Yep. Right. And it's just like, the first time I experienced that, I was like, how is this happening? You know, it's like, this is like a book. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really starts to open up your eyes into what's possible and the nature of reality and space and time and a lot of the things that we've been conditioned to believe. Yeah. Yeah, his book is about as potent as it gets with that direct pointing type stuff. I like to say mine's maybe a little, a little more specific in some areas, and it talks about things in specific ways like thoughts and emotions, but his book is masterfully written. It, it has turned more people toward what I might call um, authentic or true spirituality than probably any book in any recent history, I would say. And so it's often the first book I would suggest to somebody if they're interested in this topic. What What is your interpretation of, you know, so your your path was incredibly rapid. Um, you know, you found this book, there's a sense of familiarity, you read it a bunch, boom, like reality <laughs> deconstructs. Um, and then there's other people that have, you know, been doing lots of emotional healing, have been meditating for years, been doing all of the things. How do you interpret those two separate journeys and timelines um, and why those exist in the way that they do? It's a really, really good question. There, there's certainly a lot of overlap. And in fact, after people have that initial big shift, sometimes it's a bigger shift than other times, but it's a fundamentally irreversible shift when it happens properly. The, well, it can't happen improperly, but when it actually definitely happens and it's not just a belief or an experience, which sometimes also happens. Um, w when that occurs or after that occurs, much of what I work with, with people is like emotion work integration. I'll suggest to them, go do breath work, go do, you know, occasionally I'll suggest to people, go do some ayahuasca. You may need it. You know, that just this, this integration process is very, very, very important. So you can do a lot of that work ahead of time for sure. And it will definitely ease the transition of awakening for people. Um, I'm not sure how much choice you have over this really, because again, people have an instinct on how quickly they want to wake up. I'm glad I did none of that before I woke up because I probably would have delayed it longer than it was necessary. 
I, I needed to go completely beyond the whole human dimension. It just, that's how I would want set up for it. But, um, but there's nothing wrong with doing it the other way. Now, <clears throat> if, if someone has been, do and I did meditate for four years before this happened, by the way, and the, the price of admission for me was suffering. It was overt suffering internally. Um, so there, there was more than just that couple of weeks that led up to it, I would say. But anyway, um, so if somebody has done, been meditating, done mindfulness practices, been doing emotion work, breath work, all that stuff, wonderful. Um, that's why I really emphasize authenticity. What is it you really, really want? What does your instinct tell you about going beyond everything you think about yourself in the world? If, if, if you can ask that question, do I really want to go beyond myself? Do I want to let go of my identity structure? If you're like, hell yeah, I do, which endlessly surprises me when people say that to me because they still do. Oh, I want to go there. Like, hmm. You, you kind of think you want to go there and you do and you don't. And trust me, there's gonna be parts of you that do not want to go, but it's going to be already going, you know, you can't stop it. Uh, but, but also I think their deeper instinct is right. They, they, they know it's the right thing to do for them and they know they can do it. And, and that's great. But if part of you is like, I don't want to go beyond my identity. Like I'm fine with my identity. I just want to continue to heal and, and, you know, have community with people and have better relationships. Again, there is nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it. There's a lot of this that's very conditions-based. The conditions may change for you, where all of a sudden it's just not satisfying the way it used to be to feel emotionally connected, to communicate in clear ways emotionally with others. And all of that stuff is far better in the relative than not doing it. You know, But at some point, you may find that even that is still unsatisfying. That's when this, this kind of <clears throat> movement comes in. Yeah. And once you really orient to it, it's, I don't have doubts. Like I'll have people sometimes with a lot of doubt and they try to convince me of their doubt. Don't you think some people can't wake up? Like what if, you know, I know they're talking about themselves. Right. And I'm like pointing them to their doubt. I'm like, look at your doubt. Look how much doubt you're carrying right now. That's your barrier. If you really want to wake up, you have to go beyond that. If you don't want to wake up, keep holding on to that for a while. You know, uh, it's a very simple thing because when you realize all of your doubt is also one thought, every doubt you've ever had is also a thought. Well, what's beyond doubt? What's what is there when there's no doubt anymore? Whoa, right? That there's a lot of pointers to this. There's a lot of ways to to orient people past thoughts. But what I feel when I'm working directly with someone or they're asking a question is fixation. Because what's on the other side of that is indescribable. But I will tell you one thing it's not, and it's not fixated. There's no fixation. That's energetically, it's obvious. There's no fixation. It's like infinite degree freedom. So when I work with somebody. I don't, it doesn't matter what they're thinking. It doesn't matter even what they're feeling. What matters is where their fixation is, what they're holding on to at the identity level. And then we just go right there. And that's, that's how I work with people. But there are good mm. questions you can ask yourself to, to do it on your own as well. How does the texture of the heart change after this experience? And is that consistent? Well, that's a really good question. And we could talk, we could do a whole show on this. Um, it's not necessarily consistent in the short term, it's quite consistent in the long run. Okay. So in the short term, it can surprise you. It can change dramatically. Um, parts of what you thought were you that, that empathized can go away and you'll feel like, I don't have empathy. Oh my God, where'd my empathy go? And then when you're in a situation where empathy is called, called on, you feel complete absorption into that other person's pain. You're like, oh shit, go away. I don't want so much empathy, you know? <laughs> so it, it's just that you don't live in your head anymore. So everything is situational. But um, when I said before that I didn't talk about this for many years, and I, the only reason I give myself permission to do it is because I know it's deeply okay, really, in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, it leads you to a place of okayness. Uh, there's one other component to it, and it's this, and that is, I know that even when people going through this process are going through the, the hardest part of it, call it like a dark night of the soul or whatever, um, which all, pretty much everyone will go through some form of that at some point. Even when you're going through that, I, I'm, I'm rest assured that, that you're doing less harm to yourself and to anyone around you than you would have without that. That's, that's all I can say about it. It's when you come into contact with your own suffering, it opens your heart and your energetics to the suffering of the world. And you can't ignore that. 
And then, then you move differently through the world. You empathize differently. You connect with people much more effortlessly and with, with everything actually. So it, it's even when the, it's very heavy and there's a lot of very difficult emotional stuff going, going through and all that, even then, um, you're in a far better place, all things considered outside the scope of your internal self, um, for yourself and for everyone around you than you would be otherwise. That's, that's Buddhism. I mean, really that's the underlying, that's the kind of the upshot of Buddhism is that, you know, delusion leads to the endless arising of greed, um, you know, delusion, et cetera, et cetera. We can reverse all that, um, internally and, and you can take some work, but it benefits everyone around you. Yeah, man. I mean, that's a compelling sales pitch. <laughs> You'll always be better off. Um, I think so. I really do. Yeah. But you, I, it will I, be difficult subjectively at times. And I, I really in, emphasize that. If someone's asking, why, Angela, why do you make this sound scary sometimes and stuff? And I, I, I'll, I'll get comments on my YouTube that say, sometimes I talk too much about the dark side of things or whatever. Um, the reason I think I do it, well, two reasons. One is it's true. That you're going to go through things. You're going to also go through bliss states. You're going to go through ecstatic states like you've never imagined. But what happens endlessly, even can, in the contemporary spirituality and pop spirituality, is people focus on that. They emphasize, overemphasize mm. the bliss states, the fluid flow states, the, the, all of it. And, and they do feel good. They absolutely feel good, but they're not really the point of realization. The point of realization is an identity thing. It's about identity. Um, and you will move beyond attachment to even pleasure and avoidance of pain. You'll move beyond the attachments to those. You'll still physically experience them in the relative world. Like if I hit my hammer, a thumb with a hammer, it still hurts, but that's all that happens is it hurts. There's no one that got hurt. There's no, um, and, and oh, the other thing that happens is physiologic response. So I'll move my hand next time I hit the hammer. Like you learn from it. Those, but those things can happen completely unconsciously, right? You don't have to consciously think, do I want to walk in front of traffic? You just know not to do it. So um, there will be adjustments, but what doesn't happen is going into your head and going, oh my God, why did I do that? I was so stupid. I, you know, mm. oh my, all this pain, what am I going to do now? My thumb's broken, blah, blah, you know, like it's just quiet. Like, it's just like, oh, that's what happened. And then the next thing happens and the next thing happens. Um, pleasure's the same way. Like I find, this is, may sound strange, but when we're mind identified, we not only avoid pain, we avoid pleasure. We avoid profound pleasure. We oh, like certain kinds definitely. of pleasure, but only to a certain degree. When pleasure becomes overwhelming, we identify, we become a self again. So what I find is both of those, the restraints are gone. I can feel pleasure and pain far, far, far more profoundly than I ever did. But in that, they start to become very equanimous. Like there's an equanimity of experience that's kind of there all the time now. Whether it's pleasure or pain, I don't really care. I actually don't have it. I don't have a preference anymore about that. Isn't that weird? That's so funny. Yeah. yeah and I, I definitely relate to what you're saying around in a weird way, uh, shying away from bliss. I realized this not that long ago where the mind was viewing bliss and it was like, okay, next thing. Okay. Next thing. And I'm like, Whoa, this is weird. I'm resisting bliss. Mm -hmm. I'm, there's, there's a trying to get somewhere. Um, instead of enjoying. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a really <clears throat> strange, really strange reference. But if, if anyone here has read my book, they know I like to put quotes in the book from all kinds of people, from scientists, from philosophers, Zen masters. Have you, I don't know if you've read my book or. Uh, I haven't read your book yet. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So I put a lot of quotes in there. So qu quotes by Einstein and quotes by writers, but I also put quotes from songs. I like pop culture. Like even in songs that you think are about one thing, I swear there are lines in there that are so poignant and so profound that they're talking about universal truth. And I'm not even sure the writer always knows it. And so I put little lyrics and things from songs and I, I have it all throughout the book. Um, but this is going to be a strange reference, but I, I noticed it the other day. It was hilarious. So there's this old set of series of horror movies um, called like um, Hellraiser. And there's a quote from one of the movies that was talking about these characters in Hellraiser, these beings that come from beyond and, um, they say they're angels to some and demons to others or something. But one of the characters in the movie said, I, I thought I knew, I thought I had gone to the limits. I thought I knew what my limits were, but the Cenobites, which are these guys showed me, um, showed me what it was to be beyond my limits, Pe pleasure and pain inseparable. And that's, it's actually kind of like that where it's like, if you look deeply into anything enough, like 
pleasure or pain in the actual moment, believe me, I've done this. Um, you, you, you come to this place where you're like, you can't even differentiate anything anymore. It's undifferentiated reality. And sometimes the most intense physical sensations bring you there. But when mind identification is happening, you won't go anywhere near that. You'll go up into your head more. You know, you'll go way up into here when it's about intense emotional experiences or intense pleasure or intense pain. Um, you go into a, basically a psychological fear state, which is totally directly tied to avoidance mechanism, which keeps you in your mind. But when that collapses, it's amazing what you can experience. <laughs> and um, again, the 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 rational mind, the the, the natural moment to moment tendencies to avoid injuring the body and to pursue things that are helpful for it, like eating, that's all still intact totally. But from the identity level, from the experiential level, it's like endless penetration into experience, including mundane experiences, by the way, the, the sensory fields right now, there's this infinite penetration. It just goes, it goes into infinite spaces. It's endless, boundless clarity. That's what's experienced, no matter what the texture of experience is. This is deep stage realization we're talking about. You don't get this with the first awakening, usually it takes some time and integration, but um, it does go to there where it's like literally undifferentiated reality ongoing. And again, you could see why I don't talk about this moment to moment because you could be around me and we can be doing mundane things and I don't need to talk about that. I can still function just fine, but internally the experience is really beyond the, the, the usual human experience. It's, it's boundless. There's no boundaries. There's no sense of self or other. There's no sense of edges or lines or um, objects, form, matter. It's all an undifferentiated experience. It becomes, there's like some Buddhist terms that are kind of nice for this, like luminous is one of them. Mm. It's um, very, very luminous, very radiant experientially because, and I like that it because it's referring to light, which doesn't experience time or space. It has this, this complete engulfing everything here experience. Everything is already here. There's, there's no way to be out of contact with anything that's ever existed. It's impossible. And you know it instinctually. Do you think that humans experienced that before the invention of language? I, I don't really know. That's a good question. I think some form of it, they probably did. And I, some, form of it, some form of it, I see in animals. Animals are very present for sure, right? Like dogs and cats and, and all kinds of animals. And I notice it all the time in them. At the same time, they do have this sort of conditioned consciousness that's not self-conscious. They're not in there going, oh, I'm a bad dog. I didn't, I didn't catch that car. You know, no, there's no self-reflection <laughs> like that. And they let go of things very quickly, which is a very powerful, um, not powerful. It's a very fundamentally satisfying way to experience consciousness where you just let go of experiences. But what's interesting for us, for the human being, that is that you can actually move from self-consciousness beyond self-consciousness to this place I'm talking about where you're knowingly, it, it, it's knowing, it's a knowingness, but not intellectual knowingness. So you can be consciously empty of all form, consciously empty of all time and space. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think animals can do that. I, I don't know, I can't ask them, but it's a different kind of, it's a different order of experience, I would say. Well, that's uh, definitely definitely an interesting thought, um, Angelo. It's like the is... universe. It's like the universe looking out of your sense fields into itself. That's how it is. I know that sounds like it's almost almost extreme, but that's well, very close to how it is. It's like there's nothing in there that seems like it's in there um, mitigating experience anymore. It's just pure, raw, full on experience. There's, um, I'm definitely having some pretty interesting shifts in my own experience just hearing you talk about this, yeah. which is, which is awesome. I've, and I've, I, I, you know, I've, I've definitely glimpsed these things where I heard it once described as like, it's like you're at the movie theater and you're watching a movie, but you're the screen mm -hmm. as well as the movie watch yeah. like what that would what that's like yeah and for some reason that that metaphor just like really resonated with some of these experiences that i've had yeah yeah so in a way i would usually talk about this as far as the stages of it that first big shift is a shift at the identity level in consciousness and that has to happen at some point for the rest of this to unfold 
but then a later shift that happens often is experienced in discrete moments, but for a short time. And then mm. at some time, at some point it's, it's permanent, like literally irreversible. And that is the experience of, I might call it, uh, I could call it interconnection or unity. Sometimes it's misinterpreted as a sort of universal love, but it, th when it's really clear, it's not like universe, there's no universality or love to it. It's literally like you look at something in the visual field and you see what should be an object over there. And you're actually there and here at the same time. There's no, there's no separate one over here experiencing that over there anymore. You're like in both at the same time. And when you, once that happens, like you, that's not something you can forget because it's so incredibly different than the usual way we experience things. Now, when that's there all the time, strangely, you're used to it. It's, there's nothing right. to say about it. It's just like, this is how it actually is, but it still can be quite strange at times. And, and it's really f quite fascinating. Actually, it's, it's profoundly fascinating and it never stops being fascinating because it's always new. There's yeah. nothing looking back on an experience of co continuity anymore. So there's only what's just arising in this moment. So would you, would you categorize, and I think this is one of my own learnings is, um, you know, I used to look at enlightenment, like you said, as like some endpoint, some destination that people get to that they talk about in these texts. Um, your perspective is that <clears throat> like, what is the state at which the term colloquially enlightenment is referring to? Sure. So I think even historically, it means different things, not because they're different pathways, but because sometimes when people speak about enlightenment, I don't think they've gone through the whole thing yet. Sometimes they have, I think. So even historically, it does mean different things. And there's some, there's these, as you can imagine, there's debates that go on that have been going on for 2000 years about like, Advaita this Vedanta. Is enlightenment. No, this is enlightenment. Advaita, Advaita Vedanta versus Buddhism, Anatta versus, you know, all of it. So, um, so there are debates, but I don't think of it in terms of the doctrine that matters. It's, it's actually the person. So I'm certain in all walks of life and all places in the world, there have been truly enlightened or liberated people. So I'll define it this way. And I'll start with the question you asked. And that is, do you find that you get to this place of whatever, some ultimate experience? What's really interesting about this is at some point, the sense of being someone that can get to an ultimate place, the whole sense of that actually goes away. It go, there's no, there's no one that wants to do that anymore. There's no one that could do that anymore. And there never really was. And there's also not, not for anyone else, which is really strange. So that actually goes completely away. And in this, again, it's, it's a thing I can't even talk about, but I've gone through it and I've seen other people go through it. And when I even use the term I now, that's only for the relative. There's no sense of I, but I'm using it for the relative. There's no other way to talk about this. So that actually ends. And when that ends, I would not even really properly call that liberation or enlightenment just yet, but it is liberation from the, the, the fundamental illusion, which is the illusion of a separate distinct self. And with that, you actually lose the illusion of a separate world out there. You lose the illusion of separateness and discreteness. You lose the illusion of form permanently. You lose the illusion of actually not form. So all of the contradictions in thought are just obliterated. There's, there's nothing like that anymore. So you actually see what's what with crystal clarity and you can't unsee it, but you'll never be able to describe it. Now you can still feel some suffering intermittently with this for a while. Um, but what's beautiful is there's nothing to hide from the suffering anymore. There's no self structure internally that can avoid, apparently avoid that suffering anymore to hide somewhere. There's nowhere it can go. So you actually feel the suffering very directly, um, which can feel super intense energetically, but it also goes away very quickly and it comes in spurts. So there's like, you know, still there may be some unresolved stuff in the, in the body mind that just come to the surface and it's just obliterated pretty quickly. Um, at some point that essentially stops happening. Although it's, it's always possible. I could still feel something come and sublimate into, into infinity pretty quickly. And it might be intense, but there's nothing that doesn't matter. There's no one who's concerned about that. It just happens, but it becomes very, very infrequent. So, um, what ultimately happens is there's this very fundamental reversal in your general orientation to experience. They turns from a no to a yes. 
So instead of always looking at how not to experience something or how to mitigate experience or how to control experience, that completely reverses. And there's this like, uh, it's like falling inward into experience endlessly. And it's like, yes, 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 yes. Keep it coming. You know, that, there's no one there doing that, but it, it has that feeling of like, oh my God, I'm getting away with something. Like how, how can this even be possible that you can just enjoy everything and you, but you can. And is that because you're constantly operating from spontaneity, like from the present moment? That's a part of it for sure. That's a, that's a component of it. Yeah. Spontaneity is something that I don't think fully comes online to late stage realization, but that it's full on when this reversal happens, where there's no resistance to even suffering anymore. And then when there's no resistance to suffering, it, it dissipates very quickly. So, um, yeah, I, I would I would say that that's that's true spontaneity. There, you just really kind of enjoy whatever happens. That's that's awesome. So just to kind of ground this conversation, because I know some people are probably listening to this and going, "What the fuck?" <laughs> um, yeah. Like, what does your life look like? Like, you know, like what is some, like what do you do? You have a family? Like, do do you work? Like, do you make money? Like, people are probably like, "What does this person do?" Well, from I sit this vantage your- point. I sit under a bridge most of the day and I make <laughs> shoes out of weeds and, and I hand them to people as they walk by. <laughs> no, no, I'm actually an anesthesiologist. So, um, I work full time as an anesthesiologist. So I do general, general anesthesiology practice. Um, and in the last five or six years of my life has also taken on this other role of making lots of videos, um, doing retreats and stuff like that. Uh, that, just kind of came on. It came pretty organically, actually just snowballed from a few conversations to like much bigger platforms and being on Z dog MD's platform. He interviewed me for a series of six interviews uh, about a year and a half ago that blew everything up. Like, cause he had a huge following. It was right after COVID and a bunch of medical people and different people got in contact with me after that. So now I have a big audience and I just do the same thing. Literally. I just say the same things. I still do the same Q and A's. Um, I just do it on bigger scales, bigger retreats and stuff. So, um, with all of that, you'd say I'm pretty busy. Like I, I, um, do a lot, but it still feels completely effortless. Really. It's so strange. Like it, it feels like nothing's really happening, but the texture of the moment. It's just immersion into the moment. And so um, I have to step back and go, oh yeah, wow, I do have you know this many YouTube views now and I have the retreat that has this many people in it. And But I don't care. I don't, there's no buy-in. I just, it's fine. Whatever happens is just whatever happens. It's totally fine. Um, and I feel like that with with kind of everything, with the, the work like anesthesiology, uh, a lot of people ask that they're in technical fields and they're worried like, how can I operate without thinking all the time and having an internal self and all this. And I'm like, man, it's so much easier. It's so much easier to, to do this stuff without having to navigate unnecessary thought because the vast majority of all that thought is completely counterproductive anyway. Self-doubt, mm. fear. You don't need any of that stuff. You can still make good decisions. It just happens. The decision just comes. It's so simple. So yeah. Um, as far as family, uh, like, uh, I, during medical school residency, actually the two residencies, um, I was married, got divorced several years ago. Um, and interestingly, the person I got divorced from also had a big awakening after we broke up. So apparently that had to happen, but, um, and raised two, two boys through that time. They're in their twenties now and they're doing fine. Um, and I have a partner now that I've been with for a handful of years. And she also teaches this kind of stuff, like non-duality makes videos and does one-on-one, um, like work with people who are going through the process. So it's awesome. very clear as well. That's awesome. And so everyone listening, you can be a person in the world and have this amazing inner experience. And um, I appreciate you sharing that with us and uh, walking us through that. I think it's helpful for people to just recognize that <clears throat> the, the outer experience doesn't have to look so drastically different with no. this shift in inner experience. Yeah, it often doesn't much at all, honestly. The the biggest changes I would see, I mean, I know when we talk about liberated uh, people or enlightened people, so uh, which is a very funny thing to even say. When when it happens to you, there's no sense of like, oh, I'm liberated or I'm enlightened. That that whole paradigm's gone. There's nothing that could collect that badge of honor. There's nothing there. It's so weird. But but it, in the par- in the relative 
description of the world, there's a truth to it. So the people I know who I would say are truly enlightened or truly liberated, which is a good number now. Um, the biggest differences I would see is some of them do some of this, like, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching with people about around that. Some don't at all. Um, they probably spend a little more time in solitude just, you know, with just themselves or their partner. Um, but, but they're still often quite engaged in life in social circles and professions they work. Um, very few of them I know are monastic, like in a monastery or anything. I do know a couple, but that's because they found me. Um, so yeah, it, it changes your inner experience profoundly, fundamentally, irreversibly, but your outer life can look quite the same. Actually, um, people around you will notice something for sure. The closer they are to you, the more they'll notice. And you will have an effect on people and it won't always be like, oh, I feel so blissed out around this person. There will be times they feel like that. There'll be other times when it's very difficult because there's, you're like a mirror. You're just like a mirror to them. Like you can't not be, even if you don't say anything, it's not like you tell someone, oh, you're unenlightened because you're thinking this and that. Like you don't, none of that happens. But well, for me, it doesn't. Um, it could for others, I suppose, but that would be an earlier stage of like Zen stink or something. But it's not like that. It's it's literally the way you move. It, it's the the way you communicate or don't communicate. There's no ability to form an inner person anymore. So then you can't go into complicity with someone else's inner person anymore. And they feel that and it feels can feel strange to them. And if they're emotionally connected to you, it can feel very difficult at times. At other times, it feels very good to them. But what I find is they tend to start waking up in, mm. in many situations I've come into contact with. People's relationships, as your real realization deepens, it often affects your partner. It doesn't always, but often it does. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, it makes sense that if this was causing them to face things because you're a mirror, then that might accelerate stuff. Mm -hmm. Angela, well, this has been awesome, man. Uh, so much fun. And I got to say, I've had all kinds of sensations in my body and some far out inner experiences during our conversation. <laughs> so it's, it's good, awesome. good, good vibes, man. And yeah, um, yeah very grateful for you and your teachings and your experience. And I know there's going to be some people I already have thought of a few in my head that listen to this, that are going to want to want to learn a little bit more about some of your teachings. Where is the best place for them to do that? So I have a book called awake. It's your turn. And I took a couple of long years to write it in very precise ways. Um, it's very well reviewed from the people who are going through this, who have interacted with me on it. So it seems to work. Um, but it's also probably the most precise stuff I've ever created because I had to edit it over and over and over. So that's probably the number one resource I would say is just check out my book on Amazon. Awake, it's your turn. Uh, my last name is D-I-L-U-L-L-O. But usually you can find it by just that title. Um, and then, yeah, check, I have a website, www.simplyalwaysawake.com. It's all one word. And there's resources on there. And then I have a YouTube channel called Simply Always Awake. So those are all the kind of resources and, and so forth. And um, yeah, uh, I do retreats. If anyone's interested in like online or in-person retreats, I do that kind of thing. Uh, and yeah, just to close out, like anyone who's listening to this, who just thought this was the strangest thing they've ever heard, like <laughs> I apologize, but, but man, I probably would have thought that a couple of years before it happened to me. Maybe, I don't know, it may have blown me out or something. But just be patient. You never know. Sometimes it may really catch in a different way for you later, but just put it aside. And if you're really interested in this, like dive into it. You, if, you, if you're like, this is where I need to go, just go there. There's tons of good resources out there. Adya Shanti is one of them. He's got books and retreats. Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, any of my stuff. There's a bunch of other teachers and there's, there's really good stuff out there. And you have a lot of support now. This is becoming mainstream-ish, I think. We're getting there. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I agree. And I think it's, I think it's a good thing and we'll make sure to link all of those resources in the show notes. So you can always just check out um, my blog for that stuff. But thanks again, Angelo. This has been awesome, man. You're a great, great human, even though I know you don't identify as one. And <laughs> uh, we're just, we're just thrilled that you spent some time with us today, man. Oh, thanks so much. It's been a total pleasure having this conversation. Really fun.